So we gather again and again to reassure ourselves about who we are and how it is. Perhaps who we aren't and how it is. Because we get so caught in thinking we're somebody doing something, going somewhere, or there's something to do. I don't think I'm going to be giving the beginner's lecture tonight. I think I'll just let go because I just looked at you all as you came in, and you're me, and I'm just going to talk to myself. <laughs> So if you don't know what I'm talking about, just listen with your heart. It's okay. The words are completely confusing. Just assume I'm totally insane. I guess we haven't evolved to the point where we really can spend a whole evening just being silent together as a lecture. <laughs> it's interesting that in the silence is really the answer to the mystery. The words just keep your minds quiet, our minds quiet, so that our hearts can hear each other. Because we're really here to acknowledge and honor our hearts. <clears throat> not necessarily our emotional romantic heart, not our necessarily our anatomical heart, but the sin sin, the heart mind. <clears throat> You and I were so well trained, we were so well socialized to be somebody. Our parents told us who we were. Our schools told us who we were. The culture told us who we were. If you just ask the question, who am I? Every answer you give is really a lie because it's a, a concept. It's a limiting condition. It's a prison. I'm Richard. I'm a man. I'm 55 years old. I'm an Aries. I'm a seeker after truth. I'm a lusty, greedy, doubting, agitated person. I'm depressed. I'm happy. I'm overwhelmed by it all. I'm responsible. I'm laid back. I'm confused. I'm hurt. I'm suffering. I'm out for fun. I am the spirit. I am God. I am the one. I am. Every one of them is relatively real. It's sort of real. But it isn't all real. And who you are is at least all of those. 
you ever notice how many eyes there are each day for you? There's the eye that wakes up. There's the eye that needs to go to the bathroom. There's the hungry eye. There's all the different eyes you go through each day. Thousands and thousands of little images of yourself. And one hardly knows another. I can be walking down the street so holy, so connected to the spirit, and I see somebody that arouses my prurient interest, it's calm. And suddenly I am Mr. Horny. And my whole mind has dropped. And all my love of us has turned into object. And under those conditions, I'll use anything. Wouldn't you like to come up and see my holy pictures? <laughs> I'm Ramdas. Let me help you. <laughs> and who I was a moment ago is horrified by this person. This person would screw that one of the wall to get what it wants. We are all thousands of these beings. And they're a loose confederation that we call our ego. And they all sort of are organized around a structure. You say, that's me. That's me in all my many facets. joke. <laughs> we learned all these self-images. They're concepts we have about ourselves. And they are so um, fascinating to us and they are so efficient for getting us through the world, this world, this plane that we don't hear the whisper of the other parts of our being. They kind of get lost in the shuffle of efficiency, of keeping it together on this plane. And everybody gets really grounded. They all know their zip codes, they have a job, they get their act together, they get their laundry done, the oil changed, pay your taxes, you keep it together. You... <coughs> But have you ever noticed that even when you're doing it extremely well, you feel a little trapped? You feel a little bit like you're being had by the universe. It's interesting, people work to, to realize the fantasies of the culture. If you get educated, get a degree, get a good job, have a family, get a home, get insurance, have a car that works, you get it all, you're going to be happy. But have you noticed how you get sucked into a, uh, this is great, but if only I, you know, it's like this hot tub, that, there's a squeal in the sound system. This hot tub is magnificent, but wouldn't it be better with some perfume oil? Let's have some incense. Wine would be great in the tub. Music would add. And you just keep adding one thing after a partner. Now we're getting closer. And you have moments when you say, this is it, this is enough. I've got it. And then it goes through your hands like slish. And a moment later, well, what do we do now? So it's, let's go to dinner. Wow, that's good. 
Let's get an ice cream cone. You're eating the ice cream cone. Want to go to the movies? We go to the movies. Let's get a piece of pizza. Let's get that late television show. Let's make love. I'm exhausted. Let's go to sleep. And you start all over again the next day. And it's always that. Have you ever noticed it? I mean, am I alone in this? It's, it's that constant, like, the mind is always living just if only, if only, as soon as, if then. And how often do you just sit here and say, this is enough? I mean, you even may come here tonight to try to collect wisdom. Everything you need to know, you already know. I don't know anything you don't know. I just say it well. <laughs> you'll notice I'll say something, you go like that. Well, how did you know? Either you knew or you didn't know. If you know, you go like that. You knew what you need to come here for. <laughs> so the model in your head that you're collecting something is keeping you from being here. Because you're someone going somewhere. And I hate to tell you, but there's nowhere to go. This is it. This is it. If this isn't it, there isn't any. Everything you did in your entire life was preparation for this moment. This is it. I can't afford to stop. I mean, I have commitments, I have responsibilities, I have contracts, I have a job, I have... That doesn't matter, you can do all that. You can either do it from being, thinking you're going somewhere, or having arrived, and then you do what you do. I have nowhere to go. And then this just happens. It's interesting, like your heart is beating. You're not making your heart beat. Beat, beat, damn it, beat. I've got to keep my eye on it. Beat, watch it, beat, beat. I'd like to talk to you, but I've got to keep it beating. Beat, beat, beat. Make sure my intestines are working. Keep moving the stuff down, through. Beat, move, beat. Better breathe. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in. You see, that's all going on. And you're listening to me. You don't spend hardly any time doing that. Many of you drive cars. And you can be sitting, driving a, a huge metal monster at precipitous speeds while listening to the radio, thinking about where you're going, perhaps making love, looking out the rear window for a policeman, <laughs> smoking whatever you smoke, it all can be happening, and you're just driving along, and you're not busy driving at all. This tremendously complex thing you're doing with centrifugal and centripetal forces and rates of acceleration. I mean, it's a physics problem that would cover pages. You're not even thinking about it. It's all in what's called base brain. It's interesting when all life gets that way. What do you do? What do we do with the rest of the time? It's even further out than that, because there's no time. Everything of you that's in time is all passing show. It's all corrupting and falling apart anyway. Christ said, lay not up your treasures where moth and rust doth corrupt. That includes your body, and your personality, and your friends, and your loved ones. Everything's changing, everything's dissolving, it's all going. It could make you nervous. <laughs> if you identified with it, if you think you are a form of any kind, even a thought, unfortunately, it's all going to change. I mean, you are at this moment dying. You may not have realized it, but everybody in here is decaying built into the system. You can eat as much wheatgrass as you want, <laughs> and you will still decay and die. 
just like the trees drop their leaves, it's built into the system. If you identify with your Volvo sooner or later, even a Volvo, <laughs> oh no, not a Volvo, even a Volvo, it will go. It can't go. It's my Volvo. It's my body. This is your life. It's my life. It's going. You remember the poem Ozymandias? Somebody's walking out in the desert and they see a stone sticking out of the sand. And there's an inscription on the stone and they decipher it and it says, I am Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing more remains. That's it. That's it. If you are busy thinking you are somebody going somewhere, doing something that's going to amount to something, suffer. It's as simple as that. Buddha pointed out in his second noble truth, the cause of suffering is the clinging of mind. If your mind clings to anything, that clinginess, you are clinging to something and you're trying to hold it and it's changing right out from under you. You get what you want, you try to hold on to it. You have what you don't want, you try to get rid of it. The clinging, the attachment, the aversions, all of them create the suffering. I used to try to figure out who I was. And then I realized that that was a, that question led me back into the void. That every answer I gave wasn't really the truth. It's as if who we know ourselves to be is like the tip of an iceberg. And there's this vast quality of our being beneath it. As you touch that part of you that is not knowable by your intellect, it is not knowable as an object, because it's subject. It's I am. It's is. It's I. Ram Tirtha, a beautiful poet, speaks of it. He says, I am without form, without limit. I am beyond space, beyond time. I am in everything. Everything is in me. I am the bliss of the universe. Everywhere I am. Just for a moment, imagine that that's true. I mean, you can use the thing I work with, this little um, channel selector. See, and you look at me and you see 55 year old well-preserved, rather nice-looking gentleman. <laughs> Flip, you see a, a, a pleasant uh, seeker after truth uh, in a teaching role. On the second plane, you see everybody's socio-psycho-dynamics. There's a mother, there's a professor, there's a student, there's a manic depressive. 
is a depressed person, there is a hopeful person. That's the plane when you're in therapy, that's the real one. Those two planes of reality are where 99% of the world's population live almost all the time. When my father used to say to me during the 60s, Richard, come down to reality. He meant that. Get a job. Economics. Physical, psychological realm. Flip it again. I look out in the audience, or you look up here, you see an Aries. I look, I see a Sagittarius, a Leo. Another matrix of individual differences. These are all relatively real. <clears throat> I can tell you are different from you on the physical plane. You're a man, you're a woman. I can tell you are different from you on the psychosocial plane. Your roles, your social identity. I can tell the difference between you and your astral planes when your sun is rising, your moon, etc. <clears throat> But now flip it once more, and when I look at you, or I look at you, or I look at you, or you look at me, if you look into my eyes, what you see is another being just like you, except that I'm packaged differently. That's why the Christians talk about the eyes being the windows of the soul. It's as if you meet an awareness, an entity, that just happens to be traveling in this particular spacesuit on this planet at this moment. See, when you came here, you got all suited up for the trip. It includes your body and your personality. That's your suit. It isn't who you are. It's your suit you're wearing. It's part of who you are, but it's not all of it. Are you in there? I'm in here. How did you get into that one? And you have this extraordinary feeling like you're meeting another... Hey! Another being just like you, but is who's in an entirely different universe because of their packaging. Because how people see them, how they see others through their eyes, through their habits of thought, all of that stuff which is the packaging. And they think they're the package. And everybody goes around with these huge mind nets. They walk down the street, this is who I am, this is who I am, this is who I am. And we enter into conspiracies. I'll make believe you are who you think you are if you'll make believe I am who I think I am. And we don't want to upset the apple cart. Nobody asks for truth, we just ask for security. And we are constantly picking up cues as to who everybody thinks they are, and we're constantly occurring each other. Oh, if you turn the dial once more, we look at each other, I'm looking at myself, looking at myself, looking at myself. Because there's only one of us in drag. We just appear to be many. This is the play of the one. This is God as creativity. You are the creation. Who you think you are is the creation. Who you really are is the creator. And you have a choice whether to identify with being the creator or the creation. As long as you identify with the creation, you're being had. You're just an unfolding set of laws, no big deal. I have free will, forget it. You don't have any free will. Who you think you are doesn't have any free will. Who you really are has all the free will in the universe. You are free, you're the creator. To accept the fact you created yourself, not you, your personality didn't create it. That's a creation. Is this too heavy or can you hear what I'm talking about? Anybody here? It's okay? I can get... I can't.
I have this spooky friend. His name is Emmanuel. He doesn't have a body. He speaks through a woman named Pat Rodriguez. I have learned over the years that everybody that doesn't have a body isn't wise. <laughs> Just because we don't have body, we can't not have bodies. We get a feeling that anybody that doesn't have a body must know. But there are a lot of well-meaning slobs on this level who die and they want to do good, see? But they don't know any more than they knew before because it's just continuity of awareness. So they say, buy United States Steel, and they lost in the stock market on Earth, and they'll lose in heaven, you know? Everybody says, the voice came to me, I had a vision, buy United States Steel, and they lose their shirts. If you were frightened of the apocalypse on Earth, you'll probably be on a plane where you're frightened of it in heaven. Watch out, the world's coming to an end. I heard the world's coming to an end. Hmm. Well, Emmanuel is very light and playful. I mean, I, you got to trust uh, non-embodied beings, disembodied beings with your heart. You can't know them with your mind because your mind says, what the hell, there's no such thing as a disembodied being. Pat Rodriguez is just schizophrenic. She doesn't even know she's talking to herself. <laughs> Poor thing. But see, I don't care whether it's her schizophrenia or it's somebody else called Emmanuel because I just want the truth. I want the stuff. And I'll decide with my heart whether it's valid. I don't care where it comes from. But Emmanuel is so light. I mean, when I said to him, Emmanuel, I'm in the dying business. I work with people that are dying. What should I tell people? He said, Ram Dass, tell them that it's absolutely safe. <laughs> You hear that? He said, death is like taking off a tight shoe. <laughs> Who wouldn't trust somebody like that? <laughs> and he says to me, you have your choice, Ramdas, of being the victim or being the creator. As long as you identify with who you think you are, with the form, with the dance, with the unfolding of forms, you are part of the lawful nature of karma, the Tao, um, yin and yang, positive and negative, dark and light, good and evil. You're part of all the world of dual, dualism. He said, that was what you took birth from, for to get lost in that and then to awaken. That's part of the creative act of the one. And by the way, the one is only a concept of one when you're looking at it from two. From within one, it's zero. There's no one. Where did one come from? Because the one has no manifestation. It's just imminent or it's unmanifest or it's and then it comes into form to play. This is all play. Remember Herman Hesse's uh, journey to the East, I think. And Leo, the servant who turns out to be the wise man, meets H.H. H. many years later, Henry Haller. And Henry Haller is a bitter old man because he left the journey to the East. And he says to Leo, you don't mean to say life's just a game. That all this is just play. Leo says, that's exactly what I mean. An exquisitely beautiful game. Not game, play, irrelevant, haha. -ha. But a game, a beautiful set of the unfolding of law. When you play Monopoly, you don't think you're the iron or the thimble. <laughs> See, but when you play life, you think you're the bodies. It's very bizarre. I'm moving down the street. I'm moving from Boardwalk to Baltic Avenue. Huh. 
<laughs> I said to Emmanuel, what's my work on earth, Emmanuel? What am I doing here? Because see, I gotta tell you that <clears throat> ever since the 60s when Tim Leary turned me on, that Irish rascal, <laughs> um, and he showed me that I wasn't who I thought I was, rather dramatically. <laughs> I, I, because I had spent so many years being neurotically miserable, being who I thought I was, as a Jewish upwardly mobile achiever, with all my sexual mashugan of business, and analysis hadn't helped, and I had depressions. So that the, this plane, these physical psychological planes weren't exactly a, you know, they weren't a bundle of fun for me. And so once I tasted that I wasn't that stuff, and I experienced this feeling of I'm home, it's okay, I'm free. I am. I got catapulted out of who I thought I was. So, and I began to understand what the meaning of getting high was. I had gotten high. And boy, did I want to stay high. But as some of you may have noticed, where there is high, there is low. And you go up and you come down. A little like a yo-yo. And it took me a long time, years, to realize that the game wasn't to get high, the game was to become free. I kept wondering what brought me down all the time. I finally knew how to get high, that wasn't the question. I think everybody figured out how to get high. A lot of people didn't do it with chemicals, they could do it with sex, with surfing, with skiing, with running, with... Once you knew that it was possible and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones told you that it was high. I mean, you didn't listen to the mystics, but these were the current mystics, Bob Dylan. Then suddenly you saw it everywhere. It had been happening all the time, but you treated it like you are insane before. My God, I was out of my mind. Hopefully. There's an interesting line in the mystic literature that says, there is nowhere to stand. There's nowhere to stand. See, at first you stand in what you learned yourself to be, and you look up at heaven, and these cathedrals are all designed so you can look up to God, look up to the Spirit. And then you transform yourself in one way or another so that you go from here to there and then you are there looking down on here. Yes. So that's how it all is. I mean, there are planes here where you look out and all you see is the perfection of the unfolding of the law. That's all you see. And it absolutely, it's awful. It's full of awe. You are filled with awe by the incredible, I mean, you know it in little ways. You mean, you know it in psychology, or is, well, that doesn't have very much law, but that we know, yeah, it all has law, but we don't know it. But you know it in um, physics, genetics, astronomy, the way the planets move. You allow that the planets are all moving lawfully, but you don't think of yourself as part of that lawful structure. But then you see that everything that is in form is in law. And you look at it, you see it all. And at that moment, you look out and you say, it's all unfolding perfectly. It's a strange place to be in. It's not human. It's a place you're looking at it from here and you see it's all perfect. And if somebody falls down in front of you, you say, Perfect. Karma. This is karma. It's a cold place. It's like a cold blue place. You're looking 
down. Then you come back down and you come into your human heart. And you look at the suffering around you. And it hurts so bad. I mean, they're suffering. And when you go to reach for that one, they're suffering. But what about that suffering? And what about that one? I mean, there are the obvious sufferings of starvation, of violence, of torture. There are the subtle sufferings of neurosis. the sufferings of yearnings that are unfulfilled. Everywhere you look at forms, you will see the quality that a form in prisons and there is suffering. As a human, and your heart hurts so bad. You come up here and you say, it's all perfect. You come down here and you say, oh my God, it stinks. It's getting worse. We're doing ourselves in ecologically. We're living with a bomb over our heads. We're polluting the air, the water. There's more violence, there's more terrorism. There's more economic uncertainty, there's more discre discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots. It's getting worse. Go up, perfect. All unfolding just as it should be, including the suffering. If you stand in either one of those, you're standing somewhere. And there is nowhere to stand. That is relatively real, and so is that one. You are both the one, you are an awareness, you are an astral entity, you're a psychological entity, you're a physical entity. You're a set of biochemical electrical patterns. You are an illusion. That's all equally real. How do you live with all that? Do you do it sequentially? Now I'm my body. Now I'm spirit. I got high, I came down. That's what you do first. Up, down. I said to Emmanuel, what's my work on earth? Emmanuel said, you're in a school. Why don't you try taking the curriculum? Why don't you try being human? I'd never thought of that. I was so busy trying to get high, trying to become spiritual and push my humanity away. And it began to dawn on me that freedom was going to come through form, not in spite of it. That incarnation isn't an error. That we are not in the wrong place at this moment. That where you are is exactly where you are supposed to be at this moment. You may think it's an error because it's too hard for you as a human being to handle what's happening. It's interesting because if you push away your humanity to get up there, you're standing on tiptoe. You are not balanced because you're pushing something away. It's a clinging of mind. If you get so immersed in your humanity that you forget your divinity, you're clinging, clinging of mind. And you, you end up being trapped in righteousness. That's a heavy one. That's called the golden chain. It's golden, but it's still a chain. Righteousness. I said, I am in the world, but not of the world. The way to freedom lies through form, not in spite of form. If you try being a renunciate, 
I mean, most of the people that are celibate are just horny celibates <laughs> because they're pushing away something. You don't have to push yourself away to be free because you are. All of it is okay. You are it. The mind. See, you're all of it and you decide I, as part of your creative act, I'll go into separateness so that I, this is all creativity, so I can know myself through many forms. So you go in, and in order to go into form, there's got to be positive, negative, dark, light, all that stuff. Otherwise, there's no form. And there's resistance and darkness and all that stuff. That's the stuff you play with. And you go in and it's real. And then at some point in the journey, somewhere down the reincarnational road of illusion and dreams, you start to say, wow, it isn't like I thought it was. And you start to come up for air. And it's so tasty that you want to push away. <laughs> and you come up and you come up and then you feel you're being caught in something and you look at what you're caught in and you're caught in the rejection of one of the parts of your own creation. And finally you have to not only accept but appreciate fully your incarnation. Appreciate it all. Depression, what do you know? No. Ah, there's depression. That's different than I'm depressed. Now, the psychologist says, watch out, don't dissociate, don't push it away. Oh, I'm beyond all this. That's phony. You're not beyond it, you're in it, and yet you're not in it. This is where the mind boggles because of the paradoxes of it all. Are you form or are you formless? Both. Are you free or are you lawful determinism? Both. Is it perfect or does it stink? Both. Is there something to do or nothing to do? Both. Can you stretch enough to be in form and not in form at the same time? <laughs> All the methods, the spiritual methods, whether it's bhakti or gyan or dhyan or meditation or tantra or karma yoga or all the different forms of yoga, all the different forms of meditation, all the different techniques of tai chi and all of these things are designed to extricate you from the attachments of mind to let you come up for air to the other part of your being. Every method for it to work is a trap. You get trapped in the method. So you're meditating to quiet your mind and you become a meditator. Are you free? No, I'm not free, but I'm a meditator. And there are people who have been meditators for 40 years. And they got trapped by their method. Because if a method is worth its solve, it's self-destruct. This will self-destruct in five seconds. You use it and you come out the other end. And you're beyond method. 